mailbag. Nothing personal. Word of the day is mailbag. Yes, we are coming to you live from the great continent of Africa. Well, no, we're not because I'm not there, but I will be there. And you're going to be listening to mailbag episodes while I'm gone because they're funny, informative, and they come from you. These are questions that you ask, whether it's on Twitter at David P. Sampson, Instagram, whether you've done a review on Apple after you've pressed follow, you could do that. We're going to be doing video too, so we're live on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Well, it's sort of live to tape. Well, I'm always live now. Who's not live ever? I think that's the worst word actually. Live. That means it's happening now. Yes, what I am telling you is definitely happening now. You may not be watching it now. You may not be able to watch it now because Coke is going to not release it until he's ready to release it because he's not going to be in Africa. So we got a bunch of questions, and I got to start here with Aaron Judge as we are uh, entering the second half of the baseball season. Aaron Judge, who bet on himself. Aaron Judge making $19 million this year, entering free agency. Aaron Judge, who turned down $215 million bucks from the New York Yankees, bet on himself, and seems to be winning that bet. There could be another team out there. Rumors are, could it be the Red Sox? Could it be the Phillies? Could it be the San Francisco Giants? It just takes one team to call up Hal Steinbrenner. This is Hal Steinbrenner, by the way, at owners meetings, looking around at the other owners, right? He would never look at, at Bruce Sherman or he's not looking at Stuart Sternberg, right? He's just looking at some of the big market managers. I mean, uh, uh, large market owners. Are you signing him? You want him? Owners do talk to each other about that. They don't collude, but they sort of do a dance when they're together, when there's big free agents in play, when a team wants to keep its own free agent, but they know that there's other teams who want that free agent because that free agent is so good. And they're, they're, they have a meeting prior to the signing period, like sometimes during the November owners meetings, which are postseason, and you congratulate the World Series winner and you get ready for the next season. And uh, it's off season, but the owners are all there. During the season, they... At, here's a little something for you. Funny. There are owners meetings that happened during a season. There were just some in June. And owners are at those meetings while their teams are playing. And all owners pay attention to every game played. And there's a dinner on the, the Wednesday night of an owners meeting. And there are games that are going on. And it's funny Owners who are playing each other don't sit together at the same table. It's not assigned seats on Wednesday night. It's assigned seats on Thursday. But you're never assigned to the team that you're playing during an owner's meeting. You don't sit next to each other. Not like owners are going to sit there and fight like hockey. They're not going to drop their pens. Drop your wallet. Your team sucks. No, your team sucks. They don't do that. Like, it's not like Artie Moreno and, uh, God, I'm trying to think who owns the Mariners now. I wanted to say it was John Stanton, but I think that's wrong. How do I not know? Coca, help me. Who just bought? Stanton bought the Royals. John Sherman bought the Mariners. So it's, thank you. That was not you, Coca. That was me. There's two Shermans, not related. So John Sherman and Artie Moreno aren't palling around because, of course, Artie Moreno doesn't pal around with anyone. But owners have their, in the old days, there were these beepers, if you remember these when they first came out, but like right around the BlackBerry time, there were these beepers that had little dashes that showed when you had runners on base and it showed the number of the player at bat. If you didn't know the number of your own player, the number of the opposing player, you didn't know who was hitting. And then there'd be dashes that would go around the bases with an updated score and it would be like T5, top five of the uh, John Stanton does on the Mariners. So it's Sherman who got, got the Royals. I get them confused. I'm sorry. And... Um, Thank you, Coca. I did need Coca. I need you, Coca. Everyone knows that, though. I know that. Does CBS know that? Does Metalark know that? Does Jerry know that? I think everybody knows I need you, Coca. I mean, I say it all the time. Anyway, so you, you get scores of games on your little beeper. And then it went to the iPhone, where now people are following along pitch by pitch. And then video happened. And then you've got owners who are actually watching their team's games during these dinners. And it's very awkward and interesting. But when there's free agents out there, the owners get much more quiet. You don't want to ever indicate to your competitor who you're looking at. If a conversation comes up, hey, what are you looking at Aaron? Nah, listen, we're not. I don't think that that's the direction we're going to go. That's what you're taught. 
That's the playbook of the words to say when you're an owner. Yeah, that's not probably the direction we're looking. That's not collusion. Or yeah, I know that. No, he'd be a big help, I'm sure. But I can't imagine he'd want to leave New York. So Aaron Judge has a big decision to make. And there's been all sorts of rumors going on all season. This year, last year, there's been a lot of ball talk. And we spent quite a few regular episodes talking about balls. We told you about Pete Alonzo and his ridiculous cockamamie theory that baseball changes balls according to who the free agents are. If there's a bunch of pitchers who are free agents, they're going to make the balls juiced so that offensive players do well and pitchers don't do well so they don't get paid. If it's a bunch of position players, they're going to not juice the balls. They're going to deaden them so the hitters can hit home runs so they don't get paid as much. It's total, total H squared, total horse hockey. But for whatever reason, that is a narrative that just continues to be proffered by everybody. People are actually saying that MLB is juicing the balls this year in order to help Aaron Judge hit more home runs. So it's the opposite of what Pete Alonso said, helping him to hit more home runs so he can break the record. Because he's clean. Wouldn't it be great if he broke Barry Bonds' record? What about just breaking breaking the Yankees record? Just getting above Roger Maris? What about then beating McGuire? Something, something to get everyone excited about baseball again. This isn't 98. Baseball doesn't need steroids to get people excited. They're getting unbelievable broadcast revenue, unbelievable gate revenue, unbelievable industry revenue that continues to grow and grow. They're not at football, but man, they are not hockey either or Major League Soccer. They are firmly ensconced as an 11 plus billion dollar revenue business. So why is it that baseball would ever do anything to alter the results on the field? That's an interesting question that people have been asking me. And I'd like to answer pretty directly. They would, in the same way that the NBA does, and in the same way that the NFL does. And the way they do that is with rule changes. The problem is in baseball, every time they try to change one little rule, you and all the other traditionalists lose their minds. You can't do that, you can't do this. The old octogenarian white owners all say the same thing. Nah, that's not how it was when I liked the Brooklyn Dodgers. We've gotta keep everything status quo. So sometimes the commissioner and the people in the commissioner's office do things a little more subtle, get a few rules passed, change the way rosters can be constructed, change the way shifts happen, add pitch clocks, do little things that can help on the margins. But make sure you are clear. There is no way that Major League Baseball is juicing balls so that Aaron Judge can hit more home runs. There is no way that MLB is deadening balls so so that Aaron Judge will hit fewer home runs. It's just not happening. So get it out of your mind. Now, how much is Aaron Judge going to get paid? He's made it clear that he wants more than $36 million a year, wants to be the highest paid position player of all time, and he wants a long-term deal. He's going to be 31 years old. For Aaron Judge to get seven years will be lucky and silly, but that's what he's going to get. He could get 36 by seven. He really could, but that's about it. All right, here's a question. I have a potential, I missed the beginning of the question. Hello, David. I have a potential topic when you're in Africa. Well, how about it? Can you do a deeper dive into revenue and operating costs of the big four American sports? I once heard an NFL team can operate from TV revenue alone. True or false? The other three leagues have RSN, that's Regional Sports Network, cash flow that varies per market. What about tickets? Revenue sharing, league sponsors, team sponsors, apparel, merchandise, concessions, parking. What else? Thank you, Ted. You're welcome, Ted. Let's do a little financial conversation about how teams make money and lose money and what they spend money on. And let's start with a macro picture of how these teams operate. The biggest expense for every team is payroll. 
That is the money that you are spending on your players. That is the benefits that you're paying for your players. That is the money that you're spending on your minor league players. That is the money that you're spending on your hurt players. All of the cash that goes out every two weeks from April to October goes under the expense payroll. That is your biggest expense. Your biggest revenue number, in theory, is your gate revenue. Gate revenue is made up of all of the money that is spent by an individual when they walk through your gate. To walk through your gate, you need a ticket, that's ticket revenue. You need to park your car, that's parking revenue. You buy a hot dog, that's food revenue. You buy a beer, that's beverage revenue. You buy a hat, that's merchandise revenue. We split those up in our budget under all of those different categories. We do it by doing a what's called a per cap revenue assumption. Per cap revenue assumption is taking the total number of people at your ballpark and the total amount of revenue that is derived in your ballpark doing division. So if you make a million dollars a game and have a million people, that means your per cap is $1. Everybody who goes through the gate is giving you $1. So to make $2 million, you have to get 2 million people if your per cap were a dollar. Everything we do is trying to get the per cap up because for teams which sell out, there are no more people coming in. Therefore, to get more money, you have to have the people who do come in to spend more money. If you do not sell out, you have to decide what the relationship is between getting more people to come in and then figuring out how much they will spend in order to get them to walk in the gate. That's why you have the conversation about, should we give a free ticket? Should we do dollar hot dog day? Should we do kids eat free? Should we do BOGO? Buy one, get one free. Buy a ticket, get one free. Buy a hot dog, get one free. Four for 44, get four hot dogs, four Cokes, four Pepsis, and four tickets for $44. All of those deals that are done, all of those equations that are done that used to be done in a very non-analytic way and now are done in a purely analytic way are done to maximize the amount of money that you will give to owners, period. So think of it that way. The other big revenue item is that all the people who don't walk in your gate who still engage with your product. They can engage two ways. They can go on your website and buy merchandise. They can go to your team store and buy merchandise, or they can listen to your games on radio or watch your games on television. RSNs are regional sports networks. Those are networks on your cable that your cable provider has on your streaming service. National games are the games that you see on Peacock on Sundays. They're the games that you see on Apple TV. They're the games that you see on ESPN. Those are deals that are done, national deals, where a organization, a streaming service, or a company pays Major League Baseball or any of the four sports a sum of money, and that sum of money gets split amongst all the teams, 30 in baseball, 32 in football, evenly. The local revenue which is your local gate revenue and local TV revenue, is when you cut a deal with your own sports network like Bally Florida or the Yes Network, which teams some teams own their own network, some teams don't. That is money that people are paying to watch your team only. The disparity between the amount of money the Yankees get to show their games in New York and the Marlins get to show their games in Miami is gargantuan. That is an issue for Major League Baseball because that leads to competitive imbalance. Competitive imbalance is when one team has a ton of money to spend and one team doesn't. And that gets manifested in payroll. So the Yankees can spend $250 million on payroll and the Marlins can spend 50. How are people in Miami supposed to have hope and faith that they can win when they're competing against teams who have three players making as much as their entire team? So the way leagues dealt with that is they started something called revenue sharing. Revenue sharing is taking money that is not already shared and sharing it. The money that's already shared is your national revenue. Revenue sharing takes local revenue away from rich people and gives it to poor people. It's like a social experiment. It's like taking your tax dollars, taxing the rich to benefit the poor. The reason why the rich teams get upset when the poor teams don't spend their money, it's the same reason the rich people who pay taxes 
well, many of them don't, but the rich people who pay taxes get upset when the poor people don't take advantage of the tax revenue and use the services that are being provided. Some rich people don't want any services provided. Those are like the big market rich teams who don't want to pay revenue sharing. They say, screw the little people, screw the little teams. You want more revenue? Find a way to get more people in your ballpark. Well, we can't get more people in our ballpark. We're sold out. Find a way to raise the ticket prices. We can't. Our pans don't have the money. Find a way to get more local TV money. We can't. We have a 10-year deal, and we're slotted in as the 17th largest DMA in the U.S. So we get what we get. You're number one. What do you want us to do? So the back and forth, the fighting that goes on between owners is all based on how much money are you taking from one owner to give to another owner? How much money are you taking and giving to all owners that certain owners feel is only being given to all owners because of them? The example is the Yankees saying, I don't want to share ESPN revenue with the other 29 teams because we're on ESPN every week. Without us, ESPN would not pay what they normally pay. Why should we share? To which they are told, no problem. Have your own league. You need the Marlins. You need the Orioles. You need the Guardians. You got to play somebody. To which they respond, no, let's contract. We'll play fewer teams. I'd love to just play the Red Sox 25 times. Do you know that baseball went the other way now? Baseball is changing the number of games that are played with your division foes so you can play every team in baseball as a way to try to get more fans in more stadiums that are not selling out. So every year, every team will get to see Mike Trout at least once. Every year, every team will get to see Shohei Otani or Acuna or Tatis, assuming he's not injured. Everything that happens is a push and pull between teams with money and teams without money and how to share it. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Does that not sound at all like what's going on in the country and what's been going on for as long as I can remember? Where you are trying to figure out how to spread around wealth and then the wealth continues to get concentrated more and more with the few? Do you think sports can avoid that when the world can't? When business can't? No. Those are basic core economic principles. There's a reason that rich people get richer. There's a reason that large market teams grow their revenue at a rate that is larger than small market teams grow theirs. There's a reason why the gap exists and gets greater between large and small revenue teams. One way to cure is what the NFL does. They say, we're going to make all the revenue national and we're going to only have nine home games and we're going to share and we're going to have a cap, which means that the highest salary is going to be shared by teams that are both in small revenue markets and large revenue markets. That'll help with competitive balance. And it's always been a fagazi because there is competitive balance in baseball. Take a look at the fact that the, the number of teams who have been in the playoffs, the number of teams who have won a World Series since 2000. One thing that you cannot legislate against, no matter what, is incompetence. You can do all the revenue sharing you want. You can do all the big deals that you do. Find all the cute tricks to get people in the ballpark. At the end of the day, you cannot do anything to fight those who are unable to successfully run a franchise and put winning teams on the field. Because history tells us that it may be harder to sustain winning over a longer period of time when you've got a low payroll in baseball. If you are good at what you do, those windows of winning are open longer. When you are bad at what you do, you can have a high payroll and still not win. Yes, I'm talking to you, Anaheim. Yes, I'm talking to you, Philadelphia. Yes, I'm talking to you, New York Metropolitans. So when you can't fight the war of competitive imbalance, you can't fight the war of revenue disparity, what do you do then? You start controlling fixed costs. Every team in baseball is operating a minor league system. You may have heard on a recent Nothing Personal when we talked about 
antitrust when we talked about what was going on with the minor leagues. You certainly heard us talk about contraction in the minor leagues. You certainly heard us talk about that MLB is trying to take over the minor leagues. You certainly heard me tell you that the expense of running the minor leagues is so prohibitive that as far as baseball is concerned, they could get rid of the minor leagues, have one team per team, a AAA-like team, and they'd be just fine. We sat around for hours, days, weeks, months, and years trying to figure out how to cut expenses at the minor league level. The amount of money being spent on players who are never going to be big leaguers has gotten bigger and bigger over time. The vagaries of trying to figure out who's going to be a big leaguer and who's not going to be, even with analytics, have become far more severe, far more difficult to read the tea leaves. The reason why Major League Baseball teams lose money is that, just like in your household or just like in your business, when your costs and expenses are greater than your revenue, there's only two things to do. Either raise your revenue or decrease your costs. What's easier? Why do you think layoffs happen? Why do you think trades happen? Fire sales, rebuilds, store closures, all of those things happen because it's way easier to cut expenses than it is to raise revenue. So you want me to do a deeper dive into revenue and operating costs? I've gone through it on previous shows telling you all the different from the front office expense, to the minor leagues, to the scouting, to what it is to draft players, how much you're spending in the international draft, how much you're spending on your major league payroll, how much you're spending on marketing, the fact that teams don't spend on PR when they should and they get cut and caught. There are social media teams. There's analytics departments. It is a full-fledged operation. A treasurer, a CFO, an accounts payable, accounts receivable, a controller. It is an actual big business. But one of the things about sports that makes it different is that the people cost in sports is so far greater than any other cost that it seems as though that teams are being either disingenuous or teams are being callous or harsh toward their fans because they're cutting things that are so obvious because it comes in the form of payroll. Do you know the cuts that happen in businesses that you engage with every day that you just don't notice because they're not apparent as apparent as trading a player? Using different ingredients to make food? using different materials or different places to make clothes, using different factories, different parts, fewer humans, more automation. All things that are happening that make the cost of giving you the product lower, but not changing the price. Isn't that the goal of every person in business? It's to give you what you think you're getting and pay less to make it. You're getting a major league team. We're going to pay less for that major league team. Hey, we're winning. We're going to let players go. And if we keep winning, great. If we stop winning, fine. But then there's a line. The line is that you cut your expenses so much that your product suffers to the point where people choose a different product. If iPhone cut the expenses to produce its iPhone by so much that it worked, that it stopped working, that it didn't do the things that you want it to do, you'd switch phones. If your grocery store was cutting costs so much that it cut down shelf space or it raised the shelves and you couldn't get to your stuff or you couldn't find your favorite cereal and there was no more milk or whatever the case may be, you'd find a different grocery store. Guess what doesn't happen in sports? You don't find different teams and we know it. We can cut our expenses all we want and you're not going anywhere, ever. Now, some of you on Twitter may be loud and say, I'm never going to be a fan. I'm not going to watch games. Mike Ryan of Lebetard Show can say, David, you ruined baseball for me. I'm not a fan of baseball anymore because of what you did with the Marlins, blah, 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 blah. Guess what? The owners don't care. They got to pretend they do. But they don't. Hi, David. How you doing? I'm good. I'm wondering if, you mean weather, I'm wondering whether you have thoughts about any parallels between the Live Golf Tour 
and MLB's battle with the Mexican League when 22 major leaguers were blacklisted because they defected to the Mexican League. How do you think Live will change professional golf over the next few years? Well, thank you for asking that. I would like to address that. I've talked quite a bit about Live. We've talked about players taking the Saudi Arabian money. We've definitely talked about the reality of when you have a choice to make more money on one tour versus another, you're going to go to that other tour. If NFL players could make more in the XFL, they'd go to the XFL. That's the only way you'd ever compete with the NFL. If baseball players could get huge deals from the Australian Baseball League or the Japanese Baseball League, that's where they'd go. But they can't. Everybody's trying to get to the major leagues because that's where the money is. Players go to where the money is. Why is golf any different? Why do we begrudge those players from going to the live tour because we don't want them dealing with Saudi money? I'm with you. It's gross. It's ugly. It's the quiet part out loud that money's what matters. But boy, is it loud. It's deafening. So the PGA Tour trying to hang on for dear life thinks the best thing to do is tell players they can't go anywhere else because if they do, they're done with the PGA. It's like in baseball when you have players under contract. You can't go. People are asking me this during the lockout. Hey, if you're signed to play with the Kansas City Royals and there's a lockout, can you just go play with the Japanese professional league? If you're a minor league player, can you just decide, hey, I don't want to be a minor league player. I'm going to go play somewhere else. Yeah, but it can't be in minor league baseball. It can't be in major league baseball. We've got the monopoly. Having nothing to do with the antitrust exemption, by the way. We've just got the money. We say monopoly, but it really just means money. The PGA Tour has no leverage whatsoever. What benefit do players get from being on the PGA Tour? Is it the same as baseball players get for playing in Major League Baseball? What benefit do players get of playing in Major League Baseball that you can think of? Oh, they get to be an MVP, they don't care. Oh, you get to be part of the union, they don't care. Oh, you get to win a World Series, they don't care. Get a free Chevrolet for the MVP, they don't care. If there were any league anywhere where these people with their skills could get paid what they get paid, the minimum is 700 grand. Find me a job for these players where they can make 700 grand. If you can find it, go do it. You're a minor league player not being happy, being paid 10 grand, having to eat fast food, no problem. Find a different job. It's always your right to do something different, except when you sign a contract. When you sign a contract, you've got to perform on that contract. You don't sign a contract, I'm talking to you, Coca, you don't sign a contract until you believe that you are getting a fair deal for the services you are rendering and that you recognize that for the length of that contract, you are gonna render those services to that employer, hard stop, no one else. And if you don't want to do it, then you better find another industry and better be able to replace your pay. There is not one baseball player who can replace his pay anywhere else in the world. Because if they did, they would. The, all of the golfers leaving PGA Tour for live, they're not even looking back. They're getting guarantees. They don't even have to worry about making the cut. Do I think Liv will change professional golf over the next few years? You're damn right I do. It already has. It has created a competitive league where one did not exist. The only question is for how long will it last? The thing about golfers is they can play their careers in theory or longer than baseball players. The money, if you're paid up front, paid in advance, it's yours. You don't want to do a crypto deal with the live tour, right? You don't want to take $20 million a year for 10 years. If it's the 200 million Mickelson got, you want that money up front. You don't want the league to fold, the live tournaments to fold. And then all of a sudden you're out of PGA, you've gotten older and your future revenue has gone. The way professional golf changed, it's like free agency. Players have choices. Isn't that what everybody dreams of? Do you know the pressure that you get, right? 
is when you don't have a choice. That's when you're willing to take a job you don't want. That's when you're willing to take an amount of money you don't want. You're willing to take a underpay because you do not have a choice. You have no leverage. You have no choice but to be unhappy. Then someone magically comes from the sky and says, hey, I've got the exact thing that you do for a living. It's so good. I love what you do. And we're going to pay you more. Are you in? Well, excuse me, who owns that? You care who owns it? Don't you just want to make sure you're getting paid? Yeah, I guess that's true. I'm in. It's big, folks. We're living through something pretty big in golf. I don't really view it as defecting, Coca, though. I don't view the, the players who went to this live tournament as defecting. I feel like they moved up in the world, right? When you move, don't you feel that when you have one job and you go to another where you're making more money? When you're a competitor, I have talked about this on Wall Street. When you're at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs is willing to buy your book of business for double and you get money up front, are you defecting to the enemy? Yeah, they're the enemy when you're at Morgan Stanley. But when you're at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley's the enemy. It's amazing how quickly your friends can become enemies and your enemies can become friends. It's sort of like when your team trades for your, the player who you hated, but then when he's on your team, you love him, like a Draymond Green. How many of you wouldn't want Draymond Green on your team? How many of you can't stand the fact that, he, that he's on the Warriors? Or Dennis Rodman? You love him. David, I have a question for you. Yes? What's the process for applying to have your stadium selected to host an event like the World Cup? That's a great question. Baseball does something called the World Baseball Classic. And that is an event that many stadiums want to host because you make money for hosting that. There are events like concerts, like preachers, like a Joel Osteen. All sorts of different events need large venues. These venues all have a department called an operations department. The ballpark operations department has under it, here's another expense from a previous question of a previous mailbag, which may have been today's mailbag, I can't remember. Was today when we talked about the revenue expenses of Teams Coca? That may have been, hold on. Yes, that was today. Okay, so one of the other expenses of a team is its operations department. You have to operate the facility, right? It's like being a janitor in a big, big house, right? You need electricians, you need carpenters, you need, you need cleaners, all sorts of people, IT people, like you need all just sorts of people to run something. Then you have a department and their whole job is to go out there and try to get other events. In order to get other events, you have to answer what's called an RFP. An RFP is a request for a proposal. So the World Cup sends an RFP to all of these different cities and venues and says, hey, would you like to bid to host a World Cup? Here's what we're gonna need. And they give you a binder that is 10 inches thick. We need to know all of your hotel rooms that are available. We need to know all the transportation to and from your venue. We need to know how your venue's operated. We need to know the cost of operating your venue. We need to know what you're gonna charge for the fans to watch the event in your venue. Now, sometimes there are events where they wanna rent your venue. And they call you up and say, David, we'd like to have a show in your venue. We will give you a million dollars, but we get all the gate revenue, we get all the ticket revenue, we get all the parking revenue, we get everything. Just give us your building for the day. Well, how long do you need the building? Well, we need four days to move in the stuff, then one day to do the event, and then two days to get out of the event. So we're going to need seven days. You call up baseball and say, hey, can we do a road trip these seven days? We want to do this event. Baseball says, we'll try to work it out if we can. I never liked the rental deal because I wanted to share in the upside. Sharing in the upside is when you do a split deal as part of an RFP where you say, yes, we're charging you rent, but we're going to lower our normal rent because we want to help you sell tickets. We want to help you with PR, with marketing. We want to get a share of the food and beverage because we believe you're going to sell at the stadium. So we will take some of the risk away from you by lowering your rent in order to get some of the upside. All of these venue deals that are done for all the events that you go to in venues, there is a risk reward spectrum. 
that both sides look at. How much risk are you willing to take? And the answer is the more risk you have to have, the more reward available to you. If you are conservative and just want a check, then you take a rent check. If you are betting on yourself and betting on the people doing the event, you say, hey, very little rent, but we're now partners. And then you negotiate whether it's 50-50, 60-40, 70-30. You can have different splits according to food, beverage, ticket revenue. You can have different costs of redoing your field. If your field has to get redone, who shares that cost? Everything becomes negotiable. The contract that is signed with a party who is getting using your ballpark is voluminous. So these RFPs come, the World Baseball Classic one comes from MLB. The World Cup comes from FIFA. Is it FIFA or FIFA, Coca? FIFA or FIFA? I don't know, I say it wrong every time. But anyway, it comes from the governing body of soccer, football. And they, it is FIFA, thank you, Coca. And then you've got to convince them that you will be the perfect venue in the perfect city to host. That's how it happened in North America, where they split it between Mexico, the US, and Canada. Why did Washington not get, but New York did or Miami did? The reason is that the response to their request for proposal was something that financially benefited FIFA more than another. And that can come in many different forms. That can either come in straight guaranteed revenue. If you have World Cup games in Miami, we are guaranteeing you X dollars. Or it can come with sponsors of World Cup who say we want to be associated with Hard Rock Stadium or with a different stadium, but not that stadium. We want to be associated with that owner, but not this owner. Because you are trying to put all the pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle in order to maximize the amount of money that you are pulling in in revenue, knowing that you've got a fixed set of expenses, which are the payouts that you're giving to all the different federations for participating in the World Cup. So it's really like any other business. It's just a math equation. So the first thing you do when you get an RFP is you set up committees. When we wanted to get an All-Star game, we had to submit a bid to get the All-Star game. We had to answer the RFP for the World Baseball Classic, and we had a bunch of different committees. We had certain people who were in charge of finding hotel rooms and working with the Chamber of Commerce and the Hotel Association and identifying exact room blocks and exact stadiums. We had transportation committees who were in charge of getting make sure there are city buses available to transport teams from team hotels to the facility. We had a police and fire committee who were coordinating with police, fire, first responders to make sure there's security and medical help for both fans and participants. You had the entertainment committee. Those are people in charge of getting the celebrities, figuring out who's doing the anthems, figuring out what the ballpark's going to look like. Are there going to be fireworks? When are there going to be fireworks? You have to give the people everything in advance. There is no way to surprise anyone when you are hosting a World Cup game or a World Baseball Classic or an All-Star game. Everything is pre-agreed to. Everything is pre-planned purposefully because you do not want a scenario where a big event is going into a facility and you're not aware that the roof doesn't close. You're not aware that there is a ban on fireworks after 10 p.m. You're not aware that there are not enough hotel rooms or the teams have to stay together when they have to stay apart or that there aren't enough suites in the hotels for the owners or enough things for owners or players or superstars to do. All of it gets written out. The National League All-Stars will be at the following hotel where there are 10 suites available. The American League All-Stars will be at this hotel. There's only eight suites. The manager will have a suite. Owners will be at the following Miami Beach hotels their presidential suites have already been secured. All of those things are done in advance. Then you submit your response, you wait, and then you get the clarification meeting. The clarification meeting is when Major League Baseball or FIFA or whoever calls you up and says, you're still in consideration, but we need the answers to the following 100 questions. Every one of those 100 questions is logistics-based, and or money-based. 
They want a bigger share of X or Y. They want further clarification of the exact route that buses are taking. We had to map out the routes to get to Marlins Park for the All-Star game. How will the roads be closed? Where will the police escorts be? What gate will be used for the planes to arrive or leave for the private planes? All of those types of details. You got to deal with the FAA. You have to deal with all sorts of community agencies. It is a huge, huge effort. Why do we do it? That should be pretty obvious to you. We would make more money hosting World Baseball Classic games than we would in hosting 40 baseball games. We get more worldwide attention by hosting World Baseball Classic game than any Marlins non-playoff game. Any World Cup game, any F1 race brings more attention to Hard Rock Stadium than any Dolphins game. The amount of revenue that Steve Ross made from F1, as you recall, is greater than the revenue he made from a Dolphin season. The revenue we make from an All-Star game, from a World Baseball Classic, makes it completely worthwhile. The rent we get from Guns N' Roses or Joel Osteen or any of the other acts or guests that we would do at Marlins Park, it's extra money that you don't have to tell baseball you have because it's not subject to revenue sharing. All of these venues who are looking for all these other events and have this big department to get these other events, they're doing it because that revenue is shielded. It doesn't get shared with other teams. It goes right to the owners. It's brilliant. It's perfect. It feeds the ego and it strengthens the bank account. That is a winner winner. Some teams know they can't even make an offer. There's some cities that will never host World Baseball Classic. There are some venues that will never host the World Cup. And you know what? That's reflected in their asset price. That's reflected in their cash bottom line. That's reflected in their operating revenue. That leads to continued disparity. And it's an issue that leagues face when there are certain venues that are more apt to get other events than others. But owners will never vote to do anything about that. You will never get 23 owners in baseball to vote to share non-baseball related revenue. It's not going to happen because there's more than seven teams who get tons of revenue and they can block that vote. It really is the same, whether it's baseball or football or soccer or your business. It's always just business. We'll do another mailbag. This is nothing personal.